all the goats are here in one place, you guys, to discuss the camp that was, to look forward to the Copa America, and to basically just do like a camp recap mm. of what happened, what have we learned, what did we take away from that camp, and maybe, if we're lucky, get a little advice on stepsisters from the true goats, <laughs> Derek and Brett. Um, unfortunately for us, Tack has been called away by his woman. So he will not be able to attend tonight. Mm, um, that sounds, is serious. sounds serious. No, it's not serious. She wants to spend time with him. So but no, no, that's that's serious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know how serious it is. I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. But Mariana, we still love you, even if you take Tack away from us. We, tack, grow a pair. Anyways, all right. <laughs> moving, <laughs> moving directly into uh how things are going guys we thought we'd do this as a live stream instead of a video because it's just more fun and you get to see people's reactions in real time people can shoot out questions they can talk about how they don't like me all that the fun stuff that makes live streams amazing um before we dive into it can i just touch real quick on kevin sullivan's uh, announcement i don't know if you guys have been seeing this today kevin sullivan the 14 year old brother of um quinn quinn, quinn sullivan thank you it is announced today has signed a pre-contract of sorts with Manchester City or a contract with Manchester City, but he's going to stay in Philly until he's 18 at the at the most. Now they did mention in the in the story that he Man City may potentially move him out of MLS sooner than that if they feel like he's outgrown MLS. And of course, this is exciting, right? Manchester City getting one of our prospects, and clearly there's interest in Caven. What do you guys make of it before we get into all the stepsister stuff? <laughs> well, well, Derek it's... likes talking about 14 year old uh, players. Alrighty. <laughs> no, I don't. Um, we do have a whole, whole segment, which is uh, uh, cap them now, dual net panic, dual net panic, cap them now. Mm -hmm. We, we sure. don't need to worry sure. about that. Bangladesh, you could play there now, probably if you wanted to. What was the other option? Germany? Germany. Um, yeah. Germany, yeah. <laughs> My first question was like, okay, well, if he's got a passport, why wait, you know, till you're 18? I'd get over there sooner if I could, 16, 15, because you're going to yeah. learn playing uh, and, and playing in those uh, uh, environments. You're going to learn more, I think you would, and uh, it'd be very competitive. Uh, and I think that would benefit him. But, you know, as we say in our show, I wouldn't get all excited about this. Keep it in your pants. There's no reason to whip out any. Uh, lubrication or anything just let this kid be let him grow and let him you know let's not heat too much pressure on him because 90 percent of the time this stuff doesn't work out just yeah yeah and and to be honest like okay go ahead what are you what are your thoughts quick brett, uh adam and brett yeah I'll, I'll get mine real quick brett so one get like get out of here leave asap like i'm, I'm with you derek like and my main reason for get out of here and leave is like the hype machine in the U S over anyone like him it is it gets like a little wild. I know we always use a do, but like, I just don't love the potential of him being here and all the, like just go to man city, right. Play in their Academy, be around other high level young kids. And, and like, honestly kind of like realize, Oh my, my shit kind of stinks. Right. Like, you probably think your shit doesn't stink when you're 14 in the Philly Academy. You go to City's Academy and you're like, oh, okay, I get it. I got to work here for the next two years. Mm -hmm. For me, it's like that. It's right this the and honestly, when somebody goes to City's Academy, our hype machine dies down. We kind of lose track of guys a little bit, right? I know there's some accounts who track those guys like day in, day out, but it's pretty rare. So <laughs> that's kind of where I sit on it. And my last thing is I was just fighting with somebody on Twitter. You know, he he literally had a very serious post saying i watched this 73 second <laughs> clip here's my analysis yeah like here's my in-depth analysis he has no chance he, he's a c prospect oh, and, and boy. That kind of stuff, that, kids see that stuff man like i don't like sometimes i feel like people think they don't like they do they're all over social media they live they live on social media so like i don't know whatever we can do to not have that guy posting his analysis off a 73 second clip i'm yeah, so many geniuses I think, on X. I think that's some in-depth uh, research and uh, analysis quite frankly you talked about a 13 year old that got minutes in usl and the 15 year old yeah. that got to play in mls so yeah. clearly gavin needs to uh he needs to uh improve he's he's way below the mark of where we have our youth players at this point uh 
I was I'm with, I'm in the same boat with Derek in a sense. Like, why is he waiting till why is Man City waiting till 18? Isn't that you know just consuming like three years or so out of their contract of him playing in MLS? And I mean, he's currently playing what for their academy team plus maybe their two team, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, maybe. it's mm-hmm. it's weird because there's like rules in that you know labor laws that if you're if you haven't turned 16 yet, you can't play in games that are past 6 p.m. I know that uh, not yeah, Julian Hall at the New York Red Bulls literally just turned 16, so now he can play an MLS game. He played in one last week, and he was like, the only reason I was allowed to play in this game is because it, it happened before 6 p.m. It's like Mid-day. labor laws. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think he can play player. though with a two team um, because it's technically not a professional contract. So I think, and to be honest, he's not ready for the senior of the Philly team. Like the kid is literally a, a child. Yeah. Um, Are we sure his name is Kevin? It's not Kaven. I think it's Kevin, but I could be wrong. We should get Quinn and ask him. Yeah. I mean, his uh, parents could have made it easier for all of us and just named him Gavin. And that or would Bill. Be you know, so something we can all pronounce. <laughs> Bill, I love you, Bill. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing about him leaving for me. He can't leave until he's 16, period, right? Right. It doesn't matter who wants it. So hopefully at 16, if he's playing regularly in MLS and and doing really well, then, you know, Man City might feel like, well, there's no point in leaving him there at 16, so it is time to move him on. I will say there was talk of him going to Lommel, which is a Manchester City farm team in the Belgian second division. MLS is way better than that. Yeah. So – I trust MLS up to a point. I think I trust them for the mm-hmm. early years, but then I think he does need to get going. And look, if he at 16, he might still be in Philly too, in which case you haven't really made the progress you're going to. And you could argue both ways. You could argue he's not then ready to leave, or you could argue maybe he needs a better environment. You know, right. But you're right. You guys are all right. We just don't know. And generally I would – Air on the side of not overhyping a, a literal pubescent boy, like that, you know, let him be. He's a kid, he's 14, he's not even in high school, right? Like, this is middle mm-hmm. school age, right? Or entering high school, maybe. I was in high school in 14, hey, so. I, I want to, but I was rare. still in third grade. They held me back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pete, Mike, Mike V in the comments just reminded me of something. He said, you know, this kind of reminds me of basketball, like, you know, sneaker camp culture. And it's like even before that, before sneaker camp culture, there's, there's middle school ranking camp culture. It's gross, bro. It's like pay, you pay a thousand dollars to go to California. Parents spend five k. You go out there. There's a hundred kids, and they rank you. And kids come home like I was ranked fifth at the Adidas camp. It's like yeah, you paid five that. So it's different, but it's the same. And that like there is like all this weird youth ranking culture that's crazy, right? Derek character was a kid that grew up. Right next to me in Jersey, he was an eighth grader. He was on the cover of ESPN the magazine as an eighth grader, six nine. And where's Derek character now? I don't know. He went to Louisville, kind of flopped out in college. And there's all these stories like that, man, of kids on Sports Illustrated at 14, 15. Like the worst thing that can happen when you're really good at 14 is you start believing that you're really good. Pretty right? do. <laughs> well, exactly. Right. A dude's the most famous soccer example. There are, gosh, I mean, there are year after year. So many basketball examples. It's just like, you know, yeah. I think yeah. we also get excited because we don't have a lot of, right. you know, of kids that age that are doing that, right? Whereas in big countries in the world like France or Germany or Italy or Spain, Brazil, Argentina, there's like 25 Kevin Sullivans, right. you know what I mean? And like one of them pans out and becomes Indrik. So, yeah, let's just wait and see. I usually don't pay attention to players until they're at least in the U17 level. I mean, look, if he starts balling out in MLS – Sure, I'll pay attention. But for now, let's uh, let's try to like pump the brakes on the kid. I think people are getting very excited on Twitter. That's why I thought to bring it up. Yeah. Um, but I think it's good to see that we're all kind of on the same page about that, and a lot of you guys in the in the chat as well. Um, Jeff Carey, by the way, you know who needs a lot of affection is Brett and Derek. So make sure you send your super chats. Oh to yeah, them. just uh, tomorrow. We call him Spicy <laughs> Jeff on the channel. He alternates sending spicy <laughs> spicy super chats to both me and Tack. But guys, let's talk about um, about this last camp. Three Pete, you know, th- the only champion of the Nations League, once again reminding Mexico who's their daddy, despite Jamaica, you know, at least trying to adopt us, it looks like. So in some ways a great camp, but in some ways still a lot of concerns. And I thought we could just kind of, you know, look back and look forward simultaneously. But we like to start with the positive. What is your most positive takeaway about the camp and i don't know who wants to start i can start um, oh, Derek. should we go by age 
Yeah, let's do it by age all day. Uh, the studio, I guess. <laughs> you know, listen, I don't know if this is a positive, but it's not a negative. Um, and I know there are lots of people out there that were like, well, you know, I'd like to see Raina play a more advanced role. And I obviously agree with that. And I've been harder on uh, Greg Berhalter than anybody uh, except for the rest of us here. Um, I'm sure you've all been pretty uh, brutal as well. But what I did see with him coming back, and I watched it a third time yesterday because I just wanted to, what I did is I just watched Raina the whole game. I barely watched, I knew where the ball was, but I wanted to see where he was setting up um, at every moment and at every time. And I think what we did was confuse the holy hell out of Mexico in the midfield. Um, the fact that Reyna could go back and, and collect the ball, they knew they were going to take it off him. And they also knew, uh, knew that if they did go aggressively towards him, he could just blow by a couple guys. So that's why we often saw Reyna just walk the ball into the past the midfield with nobody approaching him whatsoever. And if we were ever worried about um, Reyna getting in that 10 spot, but not seeing the ball enough, well, that's, that was over. He had the ball more than any other player on the pitch, as far as I could, I could gather, which means he touched the ball more than anybody else. And that's what we want him to do. Maybe not as far deep as he was at times, but he had the ball at his feet. And uh, I think that that's what you want with your uh, your deadliest player. Now, I wouldn't necessarily call what he did a regista role, but it was semi like that, maybe kind of a little like that. And I don't have a problem with experimenting with things like that if they end up working as well as they did in this game. Um, and then, you know, Reina still got forward in the second half enough to, of course, score a goal, but also to be a threat near goal. So I didn't feel like he was stuck in that double pivot as much as it seemed like he was on my third watch. My third watch, I'm like, no, he's not. He's really only come back a few times. And let's look at what he did when he did. At four minutes, uh, cross the field pass to Wea, switching fields. I remember that one. Um, and at, at 517, another through ball at 626. Uh, no, 1740, Reyna out to death, switched out wide, long ball. All things that Adams can't do, by the way. McKenney could, probably. But, um, you know, those were – and then Reyna for Robinson in the advance pass at 2205. Mm -hmm. Some of those things that he did, Adams can't do coming out of a double pivot. You could put McKenney back there if you want to. I'd rather not see him back there. Um, so, hey, yeah. Derek, real quick. So I, I rewatched last year's Nations League because I thought I was going crazy because I was like, didn't Weston do that job last year? Like, wasn't Musa kind of in the Adams role where we, we didn't get a ton of passing out of Musa? He's kind of destroyer-ish and, you know, with a little bit more ball progression with the ball at his feet, right? But he – and I watched those games back, and it's exactly what it was. I encourage anyone to go back. They're on Paramount+. Plus. Go watch them. McKinney is pinging long balls. He's Is he, is he as good as, as Reyna at that stuff? Definitely not. But he's 80% what Reyna gave us back there, in my opinion. Uh, he completed a couple really nice long balls in the Mexico game. One to tell, like Tim, Timmy way his feet, like in the box. It was so good. And then a couple long diagonals that are pretty similar to the ones that you saw Reyna complete. Mm -hmm. He's going to miss a higher percentage for sure of those. He's not as good at, at, at that kind of stuff. But we get, to me at least, we get Reyna where Reyna belongs. Like you said, like good stuff happened with the ball at Reyna's feet. Like to me, the two best things that, that happened – is when he was actually pushed up the pitch a little bit more, got it between the lines, turned, took two guys on, hit to pulley, overlapped, and something good could have happened. And then obviously when he got it like trailing off a deflection and combined with Jedi, we almost scored the goal. Those are the only two dangerous things he did in the final third. Personally, I want him in the final third with more opportunities in the final third. And if our team can't get him the ball there, to me, we're in big trouble. Like if we get him back there, to get the ball to like Weston in that spot, like I don't, I don't think we're gonna do very well. <laughs> like, I I get what you're saying, but I think the one thing that Reyna does with the ball at his feet that McKenny can't is dribble past two or three guys instantly, and so you have to pay him respect, which means more lanes open um, between the lines, and there's more space I created. I, I, I so. thought they just, I thought they just kind of packed back more when I watched it. At least I just thought they kind of backed backpedaled and i like i agree with what you're saying but to me they just went like a lower block like reina's got it chill lower block and then he had nowhere to go with it and weston was sometimes lost, trying to like work between the lines like weston wasn't available in those 10 spaces so i don't know like i i hear everybody i like the idea that greg's experimenting to me that's not 
the experiments I want, but you know, I think sure. you know, teach their own there. So Greg or Greg, sorry. Derek, you couldn't have waited till the negative section. Somebody would have said, hey, why are we playing Geo as a left back? And you could have gone with your whole rant at that point. <laughs> you could have come up with a whole new <laughs> takeaway. I mean, you could have got – damn, that's, two, that's twice for your money. I there. want to get cut straight to it. Yeah, you, you <laughs> talked about the elephant in the room right away. I understand. Yeah. Um, I, I will say we are talking about whether or not um, De or um, uh, Weston can ping those balls left and right like uh, Geo does. Outside of the last handful of games, I would say, yes, he could do it just as well. Those long distance uh, change of plays. He was doing it in, in Ghana. He did it in the Nations League. You mentioned Adam. He's able to do it. He does it for Juventus. I would say the, though, the World Cup, go, real quick, the World Cup, the ball he played two deaths for the pools at goal. That was, that was off mm -hmm. Wes's feet, yep. right? He could do it. I, I would say the one thing this window, maybe, maybe Greg looked at West and said, well, I don't have faith in you doing it right now because he certainly was not that great this window. Yep. Well, that's true. Fair. Yep. Here's here's my thoughts, and I am well known as the number one Geo Stan, possibly. Um, <laughs> I think Geo could play almost anywhere on the field. Like right. I think he could play up top, he could play wide, and he could play certainly at the ten and at the eight. Maybe not the six. If you there's probably questions about his defensive work. And I do think that against Mexico, we kind of got away with misusing Geo. Now. It's true that you're right, Derek. I think he can pass the ball. He gets back there and he adds benefit to our build out by, you know, his distribution. And like you said, being able to dribble. I just don't think we got Geo in the right spots enough in that game. And to be honest, I know we're all very excited about beating Mexico and okay, that's great. But up until that Adams goal, we created nothing. And the only chance we did create was when we got Geo into the final third and he, you know, created that, you know, that uh, that shot for Pulisic. Adam, you did a whole like touch map, which you brought up. And I can maybe see if I can even bring it up on Twitter here. But it shows Gio almost never in the final third the entire game. Um, yeah, it, was, it, was only, it was only the first half. I didn't actually do the second. But second half was different. Yeah, well, second half was different because Johnny more. was on the field. Right, I mean, yes, right. that's disgusting. <laughs> Correct. He yeah. opened up a little bit more. He was in transition more, but like. I'd be interested to see that half, even like where he got his first touches. But listen, like I think I'm gonna I'm gonna put a bow on my thoughts here, right? To me, he's overqualified for the job. That's what I think, right? If we can't find anyone else to do that job for us and let him go do the much harder job that we have no one else on our entire roster that can do, right? Which is like play in the middle of the park and unlock things for us. No one else can do it. Nobody did it in the Mexico game. No one. No one stepped up. Pulisic was in those spaces. He can't do that job. Wes couldn't get the ball in that in, in those spaces. So that's kind of, kind of where I, I stand on it. He's like an overqualified janitor. Um, you know, he's he's will he's will hunting. You know, and he's like, he's, I, I, I don't know if I would push it that far. I mean, honestly, I did think that the the attempt was at least for him to have touches. And as I look back on it, yes, the first half certainly he didn't get forward as much as I'd like. Uh, second half that did change because Johnny was on and Johnny doesn't need his hand held. Um, Adams just is not the kind of guy who's going to break a line and, and start the offensive offense rolling. The only argument we can make, and it's a legit argument, is couldn't have McKenney done it instead of Raina? Couldn't you flip flop the two around? Um, and then we might be complaining like we did about McKenney that he never touched the ball in, in the first half, barely, it seemed like. And he disappeared. Where was he? Um, and then we could have said the same thing about Reyna. Maybe he would have disappeared if McKenney was playing that role instead of uh, instead of him. I don't know, but I didn't. All, all my point was it wasn't horrible, and it, it it showed that Greg's willing to try a few things. Was it just and, that Mexico was horrible, and Mexico looked confused by it. I'll just be <laughs> honest; they did. Well, I think Mexico is confused because of how we played. We played completely different than normal Greg ball. We talked about this on Monday. We did not do the horseshoe ball. We didn't all that often. We played a lot, direct direct. Balls, a lot of direct balls, a lot of direct attacking. And I think Mexico kind of was taken aback. And all of a sudden you have Gio, who you think would be more in the attack. And all of a sudden he's sitting back further. And they just they, – they didn't know how to react to it. Or, again, like I said, maybe, maybe Mexico at this point just sucks. Well, in, the, in that well, way, they, you, know, <laughs> you, just, you just reminded me of this. Like, it actually reminds me of the Dos Zero World Cup qualifying win. Where we play – if you remember, we played fairly direct in that game and won a lot of second balls. We didn't really try and, like, break them down through possession for a lot of that game. 
and it worked really well. MMA dominated, you know, winning second balls in that mm-hmm. game. And, and, but we weren't like, I agree. We weren't horseshoeing in that game either. There was a little break from that. So once again, Greg, Greg is good tactically against Mexico guys. If Mexico is the goal and it's like, all we got to do is beat Mexico, to, Mexico become, to, to make a semifinal at the world cup. I feel great. But we didn't graduate from CONCACAF, whoever wrote that article. Lowry. I I objected to that fiercely on Twitter. Um, Okay. Do we have you? What's yours, Brett? What's your positive? What's your positive takeaway? Just just Greg making adjustments from normal Greg, I guess. Uh, He made made a lot lot of his subs earlier than normal, which I enjoyed. Um, Making the changes in Jamaica that need to be made. You know, bringing Gio in when he probably should have started. Um, changing how we're playing against Mexico moving forward, and I don't know, just it, it was it was a nice breath of fresh air to get. Then the stagnant here we're playing the horseshoe ball. Our nine, well, our nine was still obsolete, quite frankly. We still got to figure. Berhalter still has to figure out how to get the nine included here. But we're not we're not necessarily stuck in Greg's four three three anymore. So it was nice. It was nice to see a little bit of a mix there. A lot of rotation. Yeah. Mine is very similar. I I, I liked. I thought we came out of halftime in both games p- positive. I, I thought – I know we didn't score in the second half against Jamaica, but we if you watch it, we created way more than the first half. The Geo sub obviously was probably the reason why, but still give him credit, right? Whatever it is, we created chances. I thought we should have scored before we scored, to be honest. I thought Geo was creating really good opportunities, and that's all you can kind of ask for is can you can you connect the connect play enough and get into the box enough, and then eventually you need quality to take over when it gets there. So I love that. I thought in the second half against Mexico, we were prepared and ready to do the job. I thought we were ready to do the job to get the second goal. Once we got the second goal, I thought we were pragmatic, right? People sometimes like that, don't like it, but we were, and we got the job done. Um, And oftentimes you see him not make very good halftime adjustments. And we come Mm -hmm. out of halftime even more confused. We've seen both, but I was a big positive was seeing both games better second halves than first, I thought. Yeah, I think that what you mentioned about his substitution patterns. It might have been one of his better camps for that, right? Because usually it's like wait till the 78th minute and then bring on a left back for a right back or, you know, some, or just like a yeah. runner like Aronson, you know, do some, you know what I mean? So yeah, I agree with you there. I think for me, the biggest positive is that we now have from this camp, especially, is we now have more competition at certain spots mm-hmm. and we have guys getting pushed. For example, Musa went the entire last cycle unchallenged in midfield. And I like Musa. I think he's a good player, but I think he had plenty of mediocre performances, uh, which you expect from a young player, right? To hand a young player, a teenager, a starting role and watch their performances be up and down. But, but the reason they don't really lose that is because there's not really anybody challenging them. Isn't a great thing for a national team. Now, He's probably not a starter if everybody is fit and healthy. He's probably mm-hmm. behind Weston. And, and you know, conversely, he'll be pushing Weston too. So if Weston puts a little too much ranch on his salad for a few weeks, all of a sudden <laughs> it's like, well, you know, maybe Musa jumps over you for this camp because you're not fully fit, right? Or Haji Wright has now thrown down the gauntlet, I think, to wingers not named Pulisic or Wea. Right. Haji Wright showed that, sure, it's one game. And I don't think he was terrible against Mexico playing a different role. But I think now Aronson should be looking at his shoulder and go over his shoulder and go, maybe I'm not the first guy off the bench. Right. I think even, you know, there's pressure on Pepe and, and Balogun, maybe not a ton, but it exists. And I think that is a good thing. I think there's pressure on that. Adams is probably still the starting six, but Johnny's right there. And I yep. think if, you know, if any of these guys drop their level at all, now it feels like we have guys who are sort of nipping at their heels to take that position. And that will only be a good thing for the pool, for the competitiveness within the, the team, and for depth in case of injuries. So for me, that was one of the more positive takeaways from this camp. And if you're if you're Luca De La Torre or you're Tanner Tessman right here, you're going, I don't know how I'm going to get on this squad going forward. This is going to be really, really Tessman's difficult. Tessman's looking at that center back. We're going like, maybe I can be a center back. Luka Somebody Luka mentioned Torre. that on Twitter. Luca De La Torre has played 500 plus minutes in La Liga. Right. In the last month. And has <laughs> and nine he, goal contributions and he yeah. wasn't this even, season. He wasn't, he wasn't at the camp, obviously, which we know. He's injured, yeah. And, and you're looking at it and you're like, well, do we need him? You know, and that's that's like a, a La Liga 500 minute in a month guy. Like mm-hmm. that, that's pretty cool. And then also Johnny, right. Who 
you know, was had some goods and some bads. It's one of his first kind of runs back in the team since this move. Okay. But once again, a La Liga starter, a guy who looks like he's going to be a La Liga starter for, for a long time. And it's like, well, maybe we'll need him. And that's, I mean, that's pretty cool, right? Like, I mean, I don't know, you guys were all fans a decade ago when a La Liga starter it would be like yeah. five years ago, even. Oh, yeah. Yeah, five. exactly. Well, yeah, we had yeah. briefly talked about Testament a second ago, but I mean, after this season, he's either going to be in Syria with, with the Nazia or somebody's going to pick him up and he'll be in Syria with a different team. Yeah. Yep. And then at that point, we're going to have to contend with a with a a uh, an eight slash six almost that could be that could not be getting playing time with the national team, despite the fact that he could be playing in the Serie A team. Yeah, yep. and there it's are good. great Brazilian players all over Europe who never sniff the national team just because there's mm-hmm. too much competition. We're not Brazil, but that's the direction we want to trend in, right? Like get to a point where if Luca Della Torre and Leonard Maloney. And Brendan Aronson and Josh Sargent don't make the next World Cup roster without there being a ton of outrage about it. It might be like, well, we just had better players. It's nobody's mm-hmm. fault, right? So that's just the truth. And people's favorites are going to, you know, what I've noticed with Cat, with Tack, is we used to do roster videos in the last cycle and they would do really well on YouTube because there was a lot to talk about. Why the fuck is Roll Down there or whatever? <laughs> and then for about a year after Qatar, roster, rosters kind of picked themselves. You yep. know, we had about 23, 25 guys that was like, it's pretty much between these guys with one or two exceptions. And then now it's starting to feel like, oh, rosters aren't so set anymore. There's going to be arguments when roster release comes out, you know, Haji Wright versus Sargent, Aronson versus De La Torre, you know, all of these different, like, who's where. The only place I'd say we're really not doing well in is center back, right? Well, goalkeeper? And goalkeeper. I'd say those yeah, are two yeah. spots. And, you know, backup left back is still up in the air. I guess we'll find out more during Copa America. Um, backup right know. back could be in the air. Backup right back. Could be, I'm not as harsh on Joe Scally as some people are no. <laughs> on, on that one. Um, let me just read do the two super chats here and then we'll move on to the next one. Is it okay to talk about 14 year old players in other sports? Uh, Tiago, I just gave you my opinion. It's not that it's okay or not okay. It's okay to go, this is an interesting prospect. You know, there are some people, even on Twitter, who spend a lot of time talking about 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds and 14. And that's fine. That's their passion. Good for them. It's to gross. me, it's a little weird, okay? <laughs> to me, it's like until a player's at U17 level, I try not to talk about them, mostly because they're just children. And, yeah. and trying to put expectations or predict. You cannot predict shit with a 12-year-old mm-hmm. or even you a can. 14-year-old. You really can't. So, yeah, and, and, and honestly, there's somebody who spent when I was working for this basketball company called the Hoop Group. A lot of the camp we ran was centered toward middle school kids. So I was kind of tied into that world just because that was my job was to, like, help kids get to our skill development camps. Right. From mm-hmm. elementary school, middle school, some high school. And a lot of these kids who would get this hype train. There was all these blogs about middle school kids. Right. There's a whole guy who did who built a whole franchise of middle school camps, middle school blogs, and he made a lot of money off it. And he made the money off the parents because the parents are like, I want my kid profiled. I'm going to pay money. It's the same camps I was talking about, right? Mm-hmm. And I worked with this kid, great kid, elite sixth, seventh, eighth grade level talent, did training with us. And he got caught up in this whole thing. He did a blog his seventh grade year and he was had national press. And honestly, he just stopped working very hard. Like it, you just get, as a kid, you're not ready for that. You're not ready for that whole thing, right? I don't think high schoolers are very ready for it. A middle schooler is totally unprepared. It can totally mess up their mindset. So when I see, I know the second super chat is going to be about my guy, Oscar, who I was talking about earlier, but he's like coming at me here. No big deal. But like, I just don't, especially not Oscar in 73 seconds. Don't create a scouting video on a kid and put him as a D because he's going to read that. He will actually read that. He will find it somehow. And as a 14 year old, that will hurt him for two days. Like it will. Like that kid will be depressed to be like, man, this kid, uh, this guy, Oscar, who has an IAC certification, which is on your profile, Oscar, you have some sort of IAC certification, thinks that I'm not good enough. Like you don't believe that probably, but I there's no way he can know that after a 73 second video. I've yeah. lived it, man. So I've lived it. So, and I'm sorry if I said that, what, what did he say here? I'm sorry. I said you, you said he had no chance. You said he was like a C level potential. And right now he's a D minus player. So I'll try and be exact with what you said. To me, that's an absurd thing to ascertain about a kid on a 73 second watch, right? To me, it's, I've watched more cabin than that. 
And it would be absurd for me to say that. So yeah, that's my piece on that. On that. I, I, I will say with you scouting yeah. professionals who are paid to do this full time, get it wrong all the time, right? Awesome. You always hear stories about, you know, kids that were kicked out of an academy and then turned out to be really good later somewhere else. It's just a, such a tiff, tough, unknowable thing. So making any hard and firm statements about any player's potential is just really, really silly, in my opinion. But I've been I've been tracking youth players since 2010 that have gone to Europe. That's been I believe it was 637 of them total. That's a lot of kids. You yeah. know how many of them make it? About three percent become yeah. actual solid professionals. So uh, yeah, it's too yeah. early to get excited. Well, and yeah, and Derek and I talk about this on our shows almost every week because I love pulling up these article these uh, things because I know it just gets Derek off on a little rant. But it's it's basically we're just like. You can. It's nice to. It's nice to say, hey, here's a highlight of this kid. It looks promising. Move on, type of thing. Congratulations. But I, we don't pay attention really until like the sec- they at least are in the second teams of some form, or high right. at least second teams, uh, or, <laughs> or benching in the first team. Because like like the how, Coleman kid. How many? You know. How many? How many? How many of these kids do you have to follow before one actually hits it? You can say, yep, I've been tracking them since he was twelve, which comes yeah. off weird anyways, but. Yeah, I've been ogling him since he was 12. <laughs> Somebody on Twitter, I think, used the word salivating about a player that like coaches are <sighs> salivating over. It just gave me the creep. <laughs> I had to move. Um, okay, let's go talk about the quote unquote negative or the issues. What is your number one issue uh, takeaway from this camp? Should we just do the same old age to beauty? That's Why not? It worked out so well sure. last time. Round the horn. Is this? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. About, I, about Gio playing left back, right, Derek? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Although he did not play left back, that's just how Greg system works. Unfortunately, when you push when you push your left back so far thirty yards up the field as soon as we gain possession, which is one of the negatives. Obviously, the other negative and why we haven't graduated from Concacaf is that uh, listen, there are two things we still can't do. We can't break down a low block on a consistent basis. And yeah, somebody's like, well, everyone has a hard time doing that. Even Brazil does. Okay. I said, I'm not impatient. I'm willing to wait 40 minutes, 60 minutes, 70 minutes for a goal. I'd rather not wait 80 minutes for against a 10 man Trinidad and Tobago for a goal against a low block. And the same thing happened against Jamaica. The only reason we had so much space against Mexico is they're not, they, it's not their DNA to drop into and park the bus and play a super low block. It's just not what they're going to do. So, yeah, it, it allows us to be um, more free and their lanes open up. Um, whereas teams that have consistently packed it in against us, especially away from home, have caused us incredible duress. And so in that way, we have not graduated from CONCACAF. And people, somebody said, well, we're not going to play any away games from here on out. doesn't matter. Okay, that's fine. My, my commentary was specifically that we have not graduated from CONCACAF. And that's one of the reasons. There are others as well. But, um, yeah, that and the left back thing, which I'll let somebody else talk about, uh, pushing, you know, uh, continually to push Jedi so high, he has to play quick one touches instead of creating a space for him and allow him to run into free space, which is what he's good at that Burhalter apparently has never watched a Fulham game this season. So there you go. Fair Fair point, Brett. That's definitely a fair point. I will say we did just play away in Trinidad and Tobago. We are going to play away again this fall in the Nations League because Nations League happens every year now. So we are going to play away. Greg has the worst record of any USMNT coach in history. Okay, history is far. Since the we started having since we started participating in world cups since 1990 he's the worst away record of any usmnt coach mm. and so that is still a big issue but go that ahead was, that was soccer dad by the way who said that oh we're not we're not gonna really play any away games so it's always it soccer dads without <laughs> fail there are some of them after the jamaica performance that wanted to bench reina because they didn't think he was physical enough so i i stopped taking them seriously it's almost well, like yeah. a parody at this point <laughs> right it is a joke. I kind I kind of joke back and forth with him. I got. We, I'm on a good report with him. Brett, I'm going to report to everybody though. Which one though? The Cali or West Virginia or Tennessee? Yes. Oh, I don't oh. know Tennessee. I don't know the Tennessee one. No, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> what about what about Ogling? Ogling dad. What about him? Ogling dad. 
ogling now. He likes I want to create a burner about soccer dads. <laughs> so, likes- you know, Pete, somebody did. Somebody did. They they were like soccer child California, soccer child West Virginia, and they just they just trolled. They just trolled and responded to all their tweets until they got blocked. It was really. I want to know what happened to all the uh, all the old military uh, USA player accounts. <laughs> Like you had like a uh, General Turner and stuff like that. Oh yeah, those, oh, those, that's those, right. were, great. Yeah. Those, those were hot were for tournament. like two months, man. Like it was yeah. during World Cup qualifying, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was just hysterical. Like, they could break right into character, and it was great. It they got the motive. The it was great. It started with the Turner and the like Sergeant Adams, Colonel <laughs> Pulisic. Yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> uh, uh, Derek stole my my negative. So that uh, my negative is Derek. So you have the same one. <laughs> yeah, I wrote down the failure to uh, failure to react uh, to a low block. Yeah, he has no he has no concept of how to break it down. We we in our transition we are the slowest ever when we have when we're playing a low block. It's like no, seriously, guys, get back in defense. Go ahead, we'll yeah, wait. You you we'll right. wait here. Oh you, you 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 drop down your into your low block. We'll just kick it around. Shooting while you, outside you... the box that's unheard of. Ah, it hurts my head. Okay. So I'll I'll, 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 th- I'll throw mine out there. I've, I've got two. I think Brett, you kind of touched on striker performances, so I'm not gonna. I'll skip that one. I thought you covered that one pretty nicely. We continue to struggle. There's not much else to say, right? Like we just can't get a goal from our strikers <laughs> unless the game opens up. Pepe's had a couple in the last year, but mostly late as sub when the game opens up. So I'll skip over that one and just touch on it briefly. I I think there was a big opportunity, and you know, it's funny, Pete. Your positive was the depth. My negative is that I thought. For a, a couple young guys on the roster, namely Ballo, Tillman, Johnny, uh, Richards, right? Like, I was really hoping that, like, a couple of those guys would put their stamp on, like, really establishing themselves, right? And I think for the most part, none of those guys had great camps, in my opinion. Different levels of camps, for sure. Um, and I haven't lost faith in any of those guys. I'm bringing them all back for Copa, right? I'm giving them more experience. But – it's fair to say that none of them really had a tremendous camp. And I was really, I was thinking two of those guys are going to stand out at least and be like, Hey, I'm Tillman. I'm, I'm here. This is my spot as a backup, right? Pencil me in, right? Jo- I'm Johnny. I'm here. Adams, if you don't get healthy, I'm here. And none of them really did it for me. I still believe in all the talent that's there. And I think they've had good club seasons, but um was hoping to see a little bit more out of, out of that group, especially. Yeah. Rain saved Richard's ass twice. Yeah, yeah I saved think. his ass. And, and in the Jamaica game, Richards was like jogging back in that transition moment. What was that? I know. I, I mean, Richards yeah. was not dialed in, guys, and and just with the ball, he was. I, I thought. I thought. I, I rewatched as well, Derek, and like thought. Oh, maybe I'm just like being harsh. Like he wasn't good with the ball. Like he made simple. If Miles made the same passes over two games that Richards did, we would be killing Miles, right? Richards did not complete long balls. He was very basic with his passing. He wasn't breaking lines. And you could go back. Is that system with their guys there for him to pass to? Not always. But listen, Richards wasn't good. What's uh, odd about Richards is that when he wasn't playing for Palace in the last Nations League, he was arguably one of our best players in that final. And now when he is playing regularly for Palace, he comes into this camp and looks terrible. Now with, with Richards, now you say things like, okay, if Miles was doing that, we would be killing him. This is going to come off as, you know, maybe biased, but I'll say this. Richards has generally been very good for us and very good at a high level. So I give him more benefit of the doubt of like, oh, that's probably just a poor camp. Now, if he keeps doing that. And that's why I'm not killing him because I've seen him do it, right? So there is equity over time, Pete. And I think that's what you're touching on, right? It's like equity over time matters. Seeing And and seeing guys do it for club matters because you're like, well, I I know we can do it. We got to figure out a way to get him to do it with the national team. But just if we were isolating it, I'm just saying that's how bad the passing was, in my opinion, that if we were just isolating the passes without a player in a jersey number, et cetera, you would go, oh, that's probably a Zimmerman game or that's right. probably a Miles game because that's what that's the types of games they usually put in for us. Safe, sure, not breaking lines, not really doing anything other than the basics. Yeah, 100%. Um I don't think Johnny was quite as bad as the other three you mentioned. I actually think Johnny was not excellent, but I thought he showed he could do a job both times that he came on. He was also injured as he came into camp. He grew, I, thought he grew, I thought he grew into the Mexico game really well. The positives for Johnny in the Mexico game are really nice. Like they're nice. They're not flashy, but they rarely are, right? From a guy that does what he does in possession. 
Um, but I saw a couple yeah. of people's comps out there and the positives were awesome. Right. He just there was a little too much sloppiness. And I didn't think we'd see much of that at all with how confident he's been. You know, but he didn't need Gio to like build out of the back for him. That's why I think for sure. Johnny no, has that yeah. edge. And I know that Adam's goal was a wonder goal. And I still think Adams is our starter for now. And I think there are a lot of intangibles that Adams brings. But I do think over time, the question is going to be, and maybe should be, against maybe a, a team that's very, that's, that's much better than us. Adams might be the better opponent. But against a team like Bolivia or Panama, maybe Johnny should start, which allows Gio to get higher up the field and create. Because like we're talking about, we're talking about the big negative being a, you know, not being able to break down a low block. Guys, very likely our first two games in Copa America are going to be facing yes. low block teams. That's Bolivia has done this nonstop every game. They're the worst team in Conmebol, so they have to. And they yep. do it against Brazil and Argentina. Not always successfully, but in terms of experience, they're going to have no problem doing that. That's going to be our first two games. And if we don't collect at least four points from those two games, we may not get out of the group. So right. it's a very pertinent concern. Yep. And, and, and guy, and I said that I think I was talking to Tack last night and I said this, like we were think about the Jamaica game, not in the context of a knockout game, right? In a tournament, but as a group game, right? If that's a group game, we are three seconds away from losing. Uh, we have zero points, right? That's yeah. Bolivia beating us. And now all of a sudden getting out of the group becomes almost impossible. Right. Yeah. And the, even the, the own goal, that gives us one point. That's one point, right? There is no right. extra time with a chance for Gio to save us. And that's one point from the Bolivia game. That stuff's scary, man. That's scary. And that's why that Jamaica game is a, is scary to me. Because it's like, that's more realistic to what we're going to see in Bolivia than Mexico. And that's at home. It wasn't away. Right. People say, oh, it doesn't matter because we're playing at home. Yeah, Jamaica was at home. The Trinidad game know, is no, even no. scarier than the Jamaica game. Yes, right. I mean, it's true. Those the last two games home before games. that we played at home were utter trash. Yeah, against, those are the last two home games, man. Against and they were good teams. Bad. It's Low not ball. like France came and bunkered. It was yep. Trinidad and Tobago with 10 men for most of the game, and we didn't Correct. score until the 90th minute. And Jamaica missing six of their best players. That's what makes this so worrying. Ah, <sighs> guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, a quick Brett Oppenheim says, what's up, fellas? Just saying up, hi. Brett? How you doing, Brett? Good to see you. Uh, Albert says the biggest issue was the inability to break a low block in 90 minutes, which we will see two of in Copa. I'm worried we'll end up with two points in Copa. We're going to look ahead to Copa a little bit here in just a second. Copied our but... last couple sentences, yeah. What? I said what he just copied our last couple uh, talking points, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Jeff Carey, Europa League final, Bayer versus Liverpool, or Champions League final, Manchester City versus Barca, which is better? I mean, take your pick. Champ. They're both great. They're both great, but can we just – the Europa League, I'm I'm fine with it existing. That's okay. <laughs> stop, stop lying, okay. Derek. Well, it's um, a 30 minute rant okay. on it earlier. Europa, Europa Conference League is ridiculous. That, that's <laughs> yeah. like the third tier. All right. But this is like the NIT. Okay. Europa the League is the NIT. All right. So if you it want is. to get all excited about the NIT, you go for it. But if you want to watch the big boys play, you're watching the Champions League. And I don't care what two teams it is if we're this, you know, deep in the tournament. But if Pulisic and Musa win Europa League, it is the greatest competition to ever exist, <laughs> ever. Hey, I love it. With, I love it when, when Fulham and Dempsey were. Yeah, were they got the, close. Yeah. I watched it. You know, it's not like I hate it, but I'm just telling you, you're watching the NIT. If you're yeah, but that, but that's like if you're a, uh, you know, if you're a Rutgers basketball fan, you're getting pumped about the NIT too for about three decades. So, you know, it's like as a USMNT soccer fan, yeah, I'm pumped about Europa. We got a player in that, like back in the day, like that was the best. Ne next, we'll have the Europa Conference subconference division. Oh, you oh know, that would be hilarious. Be four divisions down, and we can watch the best teams from Estonia play the best teams from Ireland. What? <laughs> a massive play we all throw for that i'm glad you brought that up that was so good <laughs> we look bad aaron long is, is one of the best trolls on this count uh we yes. look bad because we lacked player like rodan agreed aaron agreed rolled on which um, rolled on which rolled on by the way because uh, i mean you're clearly the Christian. one that would play for our national team but of the, course the other one sometimes looks a lot better at the position he plays 
by the way. Yeah. El Salvador. Yeah. El Salvador it's- really screwed up. It's so frustrating watching other CONCACAF teams, A, not be good, but then alienate the few good players they have, you know? Yep. <sighs> um, yeah. Real quick, I was going to talk a little bit about Mexico, but maybe it's not pertinent. I, I think as fun as it is to keep beating Mexico, I am concerned with the competition in the region because there was already no competition in the region. You had the pretenders to the crown Canada who are like begging on the streets for money. Mm-hmm. You have Mexico who can't produce any players now to save their lives. You know, it, it's fun to beat up on Mexico and to like be quote unquote CONCACAF champions, even if we can't do it away from home, but it doesn't speak. It's it's not good for the future of this competition or, or the future of our region. And in turn, the future of the USMNT, do you guys have thoughts on that? Well, our only hope really is for Jamaica to get their shit together. And I'm talking about at the federation level. Yeah. Because if they actually do bring all the players that they, you know, do have playing in the Premier League, etc., and with the coach they now have, the manager they now have, they could give us a run like tit for tat. They don't have to drop in a low box block. They they could play us straight up. That would be fun to watch because I think talent wise at least on paper, Jamaica's looking pretty good compared to Mexico even. But you're right. Other than that, things are looking on the low. And this is as big as we've ever dominated this this Fed. We haven't graduated from it, but it certainly we are on the top of it. I'll yeah. say I'll say this to your point there, Derek. If, if Jamaica did do that and they did break out of the low block, I think that actually play into our hands. It would. Far. You're right. But it'd and be, it'd fun be a to much watch. more enjoyable game for us to watch. Yes, I agree. Yeah, it's it's definitely a concern. I think Copa America has to become a regular thing. Otherwise, okay. we yes. are going to be what's going to be the fun every year of like playing Nations League and winning it. You know what I mean? And the Gold Cup's a total joke now. Nobody cares. It's about a joke because everyone's setting their B teams, including us. I know. And so what? Na- this Nations League thing is just it's so repetitive. I can't believe it's every single year too. That's really yeah. annoying. That that should be broken up across the globe. Uh, because the whole idea of Nations League, so said FIFA and Infantino, is that it was supposed to give the lower confederations an opportunity to grow and the lower teams to grow. That's why we did this Nations League thing. BS. Because guess what? We're the best right now in CONCACAF, and we can't go out on a regular base and basis and get a friendly against yeah. Uh, Germany or England because they've got all their Nations League crap and then they got their Euro Cup thing. I mean, it's just so many tournaments, so many games. It'd be nice for them to loosen the reins here a little and allow for more friendlies to occur cross federation. Instead of this Nations League where we're all stuck in our own federations, that Infantino guy has got the brain of a small baby. That's why this has all happened. Yeah, my hey, my comp for this is like, once again, always a basketball comp with me. Um, born and raised in hoops, but like Gonzaga basketball, right? Starts dominating the West Coast Conference 15, 20 years ago, right? Everybody knows Gonzaga now. They're a name brand. That wasn't the case 20, 30 years ago. And as they started to grow and outgrow the West Coast Conference, they weren't able to move out of it for a lot of reasons, political. But they were like, hey, we need to get as many games out of this damn league as we can. We got to go play Duke. We got to go play Tennessee. We got to go whoever, wherever. They would go anywhere around the country to play games and they, they would do it on the road. Nobody would come up to the Gonzaga to play play for them. So they would literally be like a road show in their non-conference. And they try to play as many ranked opponents as they could just to prepare for the tourney because they knew their whole league was going to be 20-point wins. And to me, that's a little bit of what the region is kind of – at least it's where – we're not there yet, but, like, it's what it looks like it could become. So, I mean, you guys mentioned Jamaica. Hopefully, hopefully Mexico gets their act together. But, man, if we're stuck with, like, all these windows, like you said, Derek, where we're, like, basically forced to play crap comp, especially these qualifying windows, just, like, can we get rid of those? Like, we don't need to play qualifying windows against bad CONCACAF opponents to then earn our way into playing the less bad CONCACAF (laughs) opponents. But I do like that. At least we have to play away. Like, why can't we move Nations League to Mexico once? Oh, I I agree. I totally agree with that. But, like – I don't know. And, and maybe you're right. Maybe if we just did friendlies, we wouldn't go away. We would, everybody would come here, but like, I don't know. I the, listen, I give me more of the Germany and uh, the Germany Ghana window. Give me more of the one coming up, right? Brazil and Colombia. And to your point, Pete, go down to South America and do that occasionally, to, you know, like to figure out how to, how to play in different environments. So Brett, 
is saying when the guys came out for warmups before the Jamaican game, there were 500 fans in the stands. Any home's life advant any home life's advantage was gone. The guys were bummed. They needed to do better. Yes, but us as well. So why did why why were there no U.S. fans, Brett? Well, number one, the Mexico fans bought up all the tickets, right? Mexico shows up for their team. Like when I hear, oh, why isn't it? I hear things like people go, oh, it was a week night and tickets were expensive and blah, blah, blah. You know, March Madness was going on. All of that is true, but that doesn't seem to affect Mexico because Mexico could play in a cow pasture in Nebraska and charge a thousand bucks a ticket and they would still fill it up. So why aren't we doing better? Why aren't American fans going out to see this team? Because you can say, yeah, soccer is not a big sport in this country compared to like it is in Mexico, but there are more than enough diehards in this country that should go and, you know, pay to watch a, watch a game. What, what are your guys' thoughts on this? How about, how about not have the national team games behind a paywall, number one? How about mm -hmm. having it on a major network where everybody and anybody can watch it? My parents wanted to watch the game. They don't have Paramount Plus. They didn't get to watch it. Mm. okay my brother wanted to watch he, he texted me hey where's the game it's like it's on paramount plus well i don't get paramount plus well you could if you wanted to you could get it but i don't think he's going to watch anything else but this one game so a number one there but b where is u.s soccer marketing right now um as far as getting out there and and i don't care if it's little commercials here and there but gosh darn I don't. I wouldn't have known that game was even happening no way. had I not been a diehard fan. Like yeah. I had to tell my mom and my brother, and then they wrote me back and said, "Oh, they're playing. Okay, where? Where can I watch it?" And I told them where to watch it. They're like, <coughs> "Not watching it there." Yeah. Um, so if you, the first thing you got to do is get people excited. If that means getting people to watch you on TV first on ESPN or Fox or a channel that normal people can just turn on and watch, we're not good enough yet to be moving to some platform where only people who really give a shit who are going to sign up and they're going to go watch it there. You got to well, get, yeah. Anyway. yeah if, you, if you make it, you're making it an, a niche sport by doing that, right? Like what are yeah. the other sports that are only on streaming platforms? Niche sports, right? Like, no major sport is only on platforms, right? Like that's not the primary place you can mm -hmm. see them. NBA, you can turn on TNT two, two weeks, two nights a week, right? Football every Sunday, right? And I, I agree with that. And that is the entryway into spending money to go to games, right? Yes, you're not, just, you're not just saying, let me go to a game. Like you're going to know the team, like the team, follow the team. And you're right. Like, how do you turn, you know, a fan into a fan? And it's like exposure. Uh, my other thing, Pete, I don't know. I, maybe I'm just a have Northeast bias here, but like all these games are in the same places. Like you're actually going for, I get Mexico fans keep going no matter the ticket price, but like, as, as a U.S. fan, like, I can't go to every – I just can't afford to do it. I have three kids. Like, I can't afford to go to all these games if they're going to cost 150 bucks per ticket. Yeah. I got to pick which one I'm going to. Am I going to the Jamaica semi or the final? So, and I get we didn't pack the final either, but I'm just saying, like, I would have picked the final. I wouldn't have gone to both. Well, you got to fly in, too. You got to – Get a hotel room, you know, and just, not just the ticket. Bring, bring the games up to other areas so that people who haven't seen the national team play in a while in a competitive game maybe would get excited about it and you get more people out that way. I don't know. We're, I mean, we're not packing the stadium to your point, Pete. It's just Mexico is going to is going to have more fervor here in this kind of deal, and they're going to buy up those tickets. Um, but I don't know. I think there's a couple things that we can at least get the ball do to get the ball rolling. So I think one of the big problems is that we're trying to treat soccer in america the way mexico treats soccer Me mexico has an established fan base of generational soccer lovers it is their number one sport so you can charge them 600 dollars. i mean i don't like it i think it's price gouging and i think you're fleecing them but their passion has told you many times they will pay for that yeah. and so they're going hey mexico fans will pay that we can at least charge 300 to an american fan no you can't OK, because you know how you turn Joe Blow doesn't care about soccer into soccer when he's in college. If he has a student ID, you charge him fifteen dollar tickets or you give him, you know, five dollar beer at the game and you get him excited about it when he's 19 in his, you know, his college stadium where he goes on a regular basis. I think you have to entice people in with lower prices. And maybe that means you're not going to make a lot of money 
right now, today, but you're building an, a, an engaged fan base for the future. But if you price out all the fans, the casuals, the maybes, or even diehards like us who just can't afford those tickets, what you're essentially saying is, fuck you. We want the 8,000 you know, richest soccer fans in America to come to the games and we don't care about the rest of you. And then you act surprised when we can't sell out you know, a, a stadium, uh, you know, the Cowboys stadium, which of course we can't, but it's so many things like Brett brought up marketing. I'm sorry. Uh, Derek brought up marketing. There are so many things that they could be doing to market this team for billboards, advertising. The only time you ever see USMNT ads are on MLS games at halftime. Yeah. One of the ads would be, Oh, the USMNT is playing. Yeah. The MLS people already know. Why are we not putting <laughs> this on Hulu when somebody's watching Shogun or Ted Lasso or, I don't know, like advertising, the, the marketing and commercial department of U.S. soccer is an absolute joke. And I've said this before many, many times, a complete joke. And that's why, yeah, we can do better. But actually, no, there is a product and nobody is consuming it, Brett. And that's usually on the makers of the product. Also, <laughs> less, less Ivy League, less Ivy yeah. League. OK, yes. at the leadership level, less of that and more people who know growing up with the sport. Uh, love the sport. I don't need business execs running this. It's not, it shouldn't just be them exclusively. And that's what it seems like we've turned the U S soccer into it's run by people who they're great running businesses, I suppose. And, Oh, we're told that Batson could, he he's, this is a charity for him. Cause if he, he could have taken a job at a major corporation and made millions of dollars. Okay. That's fine. But how about people who love like us, like Brett, has learned to to love Brett Oppenheim has loved to learn the game, uh, love the game. How about more people who just inherently love the sport and are connected with the people, the fans, the average fan? That's what we need. Less of this corporate dilly dally, and that's what got us at this problem in the first place. All of this is about making money. That's why it's okay to continue to have high prices. We know that there are not going to be any American fans there. Mexican Mexican fans will show up. They'll take up all the tickets. And we don't care about that. Yeah, it's not a problem for us because it's money. And the uh, the talking points as far as the price gouging is the same argument I had with uh, Lawless on on Twitter when uh, somebody brought to them, like, well, once 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 Messi leaves Miami, if he doesn't re renew or re up or whatever, if he leaves Miami after the season, are they going to drop down the prices for the tickets? And he was just like, well, why would they drop down the prices? Because like, the well, products less. <laughs> You're, you're not going to get you're not going to get messy money per ticket with no messy. And he's like, well, you know, you, that, start, you just have to start. You have to start to uh, uh, basically. I'm going to paraphrase what he said, but basically, brainwashing people to paying for a product at whatever price you set it at that type of thing. And that's again paraphrasing what he said. He didn't actually say those words, but again, to your point with the price gouging, if you lower down the prices, you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about doing as much advertising. You know, if I'm able to go to games that are around us, Chicago, Nashville, whatever. Not, not many of those. Uh, I'm just saying, if any of those games, if any of those games came and the tickets were at a reasonable price, I would have no problem bringing in a handful to a dozen of friends who just want to go to a game. Right. And I get I get questions all the time. Uh, a, a friend of the, well, my friend and friend, of, uh, friend of our show, uh, Chad, he asked me, he said, "Hey, you want to go to a, a World Cup game?" I'm like, absolutely. He goes, "How do you get tickets?" I have no idea because they don't advertise how to do that very well. I know that I know that if you're a member of U.S. Soccer, you pay like whatever it is, like 500 bucks a year, you get first picks of the tickets, or there's a, there's a, there's a lottery in there or something like that. But then it just it, it, it is just a mind fuck as far as how sorry about that uh, it is a, it is just a screw job as far as how to get to the games and at a reasonable price. Yeah. I want to see with Copa America. I want to see billboards in all the major cities. You know, like in Times Square, I want to be like America's team, all of the Americas competing, you know, pictures of Pulisic, Reyna, Balogun, McKinney, the stars of this team, I, like advertise it. The last time we did Copa America here, nobody knew it was happening outside of soccer fans. <laughs> nobody knew. I talked to people in Chicago. Hey, Copa America. It was happening in Chicago and Chicagoans <laughs> didn't know. I know commercials. How hard is it to, to do commercials too? Like, yes. 30 Billboard. second, 30 second inspiring bits featuring whatever exciting moment. And, and then, of course, you know, here's the game that's coming up with these exciting players. 
I mean, I just don't know how difficult being a marketing guy for 30 years. It's not that difficult. It's not hard. What? They're not even trying. They're not trying. Yeah. And if, if you were part of a company and you were the head of marketing and you got no new people to buy your product for 30 years, you'd probably be fired. Yes, so, it would. Take, take a look at their social media. It is a travesty to watch. Oh, my God. That's, it's that's free advertising right there. They can't post a, a, a 30 second video on YouTube. They can't do stuff on Twitter on a regular. I have to go it's to terrific. T I have to go to TJ Sports Talk on YouTube to find the interviews with Greg and P pre and post game. They won't yeah. even put those up on US soccer. C can't get the janitor to work over the weekend to post those up for us. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Unreal. <sighs> So all that to say, Brad, I think we agree with you that we as fans need to do better. But I always believe if if your product is not being consumed, then that's like if nobody's watching your show, Brett, like if you do, you know, Selling Sunset comes out and nobody watches it, then it's not people. It's not the consumer's fault, right? It's either the, the marketing or the show itself. Don't get me wrong. You have a great show. I don't watch it, but my girl loves it. Yeah, but I just I think. I'm sorry. I was just going to no, say, go it's ahead. like, let's say you just started a new condom company. All right. All right. Let's just say <laughs> that. All right. The CSRC condom and, company. And, it's already, and, already, it's already and already you shipped them it. out and they go to all the stores. <laughs> but no one's buying your condoms because they're all buying the brands they know and trust. All right. They're buying. So you're, you're, you're not doing any marketing. You're just thinking, well, I'm going to make some condoms and people are going to buy these condoms. And guess what? They're going to be extra expensive. They're going to be more expensive than the Trojan condoms. Yeah. And nobody's buying them. I wonder why. Wonder the problem, what the, the hell problem is, Derek, You're the model. You're the one that's uh, 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 forming them. And they're just too small for everybody. That's true. <laughs> I think there's a there's a huge branding opportunity here for Derek's stepsister condoms to like make <laughs> they become a thing in the next few years. Rib, rib for your stepsister. <laughs> <laughs> this show is brought to you by KY. <laughs> oh God. Did he have that handy? Yeah, they used to be a sponsor of the show. So I used to have to oh, bring wow. it up. Yeah. Yeah, they have not approached me. Okay. <laughs> Real quick, before we look forward to Copa America, we've got we always go longer than we intend to. Just give me real quick, just say the name, don't explain anything. The the stock up your stock up player for this camp. And if someone already said it, give it a different one. Go, Derek. All right. Stock up uh for me is Reyna. Just because everybody was already pooping on him. They were saying he shouldn't even be there. Shouldn't be on the squad. Jesse Marsh, you lying sack and you know what. That is exactly what you insinuated by saying, oh, well, he shouldn't be there. Because of the, you know, if Greg didn't have to bring him, he wouldn't. Because, but Greg has to. Because otherwise, you know, this shit will hit the fan. Yes. Backpedal should... like a smarmy little. Oh, thing. I know. It's slimy. So, so yeah, slimy. it's Raina. Sorry, I added more to that. No, that's fine. Go ahead, Brett. Yeah, he, he said just to give the name. So I'm going to go. I have to go instead of some of you uh, in uh, Gio, I'm going to go Turner. No, not really. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm going with uh, everybody else is equal. I'm going to go with uh, Dest, I guess. He solidified his spot, I guess, but. Well, you already had. But yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go Haji Wright. Wasn't, wasn't even on there the last so, sorry, that's a good one. That's good. Wasn't answer. even on the roster, and now he's you know in a conversation. I don't think he was necessarily you know in two weeks ago. So, yep. Tyler Adams. Yep, it's a good another. Good and one. Tim Ream. A lot of yeah. people oh, want to put Tim, Tim Ream, Ream out to pasture. A lot Great. of people wanted to put him out to pasture. They and still he was our do. Best performing center back. Yep. All right, let's go to stock down real quick. You can explain a little bit about this one if you want. Uh. Stock down. You know, it's so hard to blame players for a system, but for me, stock down, and I, people are going to bite my ass for this, is Balogun. And mm. it's just because it's not his fault. It's not all his fault. It's just when you're asking your nine to play with his back to goal half the time and you're not going to be making any through passes, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what you expect because he's not a poacher. He's not a guy who's going to head up, head crosses in into the goal. That's just not his thing. So you're asking him to do something he can't do. And it made him look kind of, well, ineffective for the first game against Jamaica. He played a low block. You're not going to break a low block generally with a speedster who plays between lanes and it just makes him look bad. So whether it's reality or not, it is perception. I suppose for some it is for me, but it's not his fault. It's Greg's system and how Greg uses his nine stock down. I, I want, I want to just, I want to say one thing. 
he played, I think, 15 to 20 minutes with Gio in an attacking midfield position. And to me, that is the thing, even in a low block, that is going to unlock the game for him, right? There's, they did for Haji. For sure. And, like, some players need other players around them, right? Like, basketball comp again, Steph and Draymond, right? Like, Steph Curry has been drastically impacted by playing with Draymond Green. Now, would Steph be amazing without Draymond? Of course, right? And Draymond Green has been severe. You know, great players elevate each other. That's my point, right? Great, great combos elevate each other. And I just – I still want to see that, right? I do agree. Ballo stock has to be down based on what we saw. But, like, I want to see – him and Gio combining, and we still but didn't really see it. The the mm-hmm. big thing there is what uh, when when Gio was playing with Ballo compared to when he wasn't playing with Ballo was what was being requested of Balogun. He was coming back further down the pitch. He was trying to play with his back to the goal. But when Gio's there, he's not necessarily going to play that role because he's playing. Gio's generally playing in a higher higher position that allows Balogun to float around more. He that's why that's, that's the main reason why I think he looks better with Rain on the pitch than without. But I, I think for me, as far as uh, stock down, a lot of the players, and I'm going to leave off the players that weren't included, like whether you want to say Sargent or whether you say Luka De La Torre, we t- brought him up earlier. Um, I'm going to say a player that's stocked down, but his position is still solidified is, is Scally in a sense. He's still stocked down, but he has nobody to compete for that second spot, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, basically it's solidified desk up and him down. Yeah. Yeah. Mine is public. I'm just going with like what I would imagine like a public stock market trading would be. I think the stock on Tillman coming into this camp was really, really high. And I think coming out of the camp, it's just leveled out. I don't think it's plummeted, but I think it's leveled out to probably where it belongs. And um, and so it has to be stocked down, though, because, I mean, there was a lot of conversations of whether or not he should be starting over Geo. I saw a lot of those takes Mm -hmm. in the three weeks before camp. You're not seeing many of those takes in the last uh, three, four days. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. Those takes. Yeah. Peppy's no. kind of leveled out in the same way, even though he only got to play in one game. So. Yeah. You don't have a basketball reference for us? To well, see. you know, that's so funny <laughs> so to you say that. Pete, Adam, like every time, every time, every time Adam brings up basketball, the song goes through my house. I, most of you might know this song, or some of you might. Basketball. I'll we right love first. that basketball. <laughs> you know that slaps. Basketball is my favorite sport. I love the way they dribble up and down the court. You don't remember that song, Pete? You just might not remember. That sounds it. like an '80s church rap. It was. Derek, Derek, I, I, I love the rap know that song, Derek. Uh, talking basketball. Where's that from? Where's that from? What what decade is that from? Um, that wasn't. That was like, not, it was, it was, it's an original Space Jam song. That's like the MJ Space Jam. It was in that oh. on that soundtrack. Yeah, but it did come out in the early '80s, and it yeah, wasn't, before that, yeah, it wasn't. Was it LL Cool J or might have been Cool Mo D? It was one of the old school it was guys. Straight like, '80s rap though. Basketball is my favorite, favorite sport. sport. I, I love the wind. You're all up and down the floor. Like, it is like the oldest of old school rap. It is. You need to start a boy band right here. Yeah, oh, no. We're going to do that song. Let's take this offline. This is like Derek and Adam rap. This is fantastic. Guys, Curtis this is what Blow. you're getting. This guy, yeah, it's Curtis, Curtis Blow. Blow. It was Cats Curtis Blow. Chad will always have our yes. Yep. That's when <laughs> rap was like, yeah, I mean – even those guys don't. I mean, that sounds it sounds horrible now, actually, because it's so, um, you know, phonetic and everything is like the same rhythm in all the raps. Rap is hip hop changed everything. So yeah, I, and I, I now graduated to comment. church raps when they're trying to like get hip with the young people. Oh, yes. Like, that's what it sounds know, like. Start doing some 80s rap. <laughs> <laughs> I love the uh, fuck you guys are old, Derek. There's a comment. That, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, for my True. stock down, I'm just going to go Richards, you know, uh, for better or for worse, right? Like he didn't have a good camp and hopefully that's a blip. I still have him and Reem as my starters in Copa, but if he ha- doesn't have a good Copa, then questions do need to be asked because there are players and it's way too soon for this, but there are players who just never really play that well for country and mostly play well for their clubs. They're rare, but they do happen. I'm not saying Richards is that guy, but he needs to have a good Copa if he wants to retain that starting spot. Um, so, yeah, hmm. that's that. Should we get into looking ahead? Copa America, guys. It's coming up. We have two games versus Brazil and Colombia, There, which is odd because we're almost for sure going to face Brazil or Colombia if we get out of our group. So, the, But it was at least good quality games, right, as friendlies. And then we have two 
to start off with Bolivia first and then Panama second. How are we feeling about Copa America? So what do you what do we think is going to happen? What does Greg have to do to keep his job in our perspective, not mm. in a U.S. soccer? Because U.S. soccer, really all he has to do is show up to work on time, and that's enough to keep your job. Yep. But for, from our perspective, what is the le- – okay, let me, let me put it this way. What is the bar? Right, there's a lot of doubt on Greg Berhalter. What is the bar for this Copa America for us to go? Fine, Greg can stay till 2026. Well, it's, that's an interesting question because it's there. I have my bar, which is a lot higher than Betty Crocker's bar, right? Sure, sure. So um, for me, I need to see some real copulation in the Copa America for us <laughs> to um, continue to, and and that doesn't mean that Greg needs to you know, get to the final or anything like that. But I would like to have a comfortable first or second out of the group. And, um, and then of course it's crapshoot after that. If you finish second, you might get somebody really difficult in the next round. Um, but what I, I always say this, I don't really care if, if, if um, we go to that game and we end up having to play somebody really good and, 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 and we lose, you know, and yeah, penalty kicks or whatever, or, you know, we play a really good game, but we still lose to Brazil or whoever it ends up that we end up losing to. Yeah. I just want to see us play competently. That's what I want to see. I want to see a team that's together, a team that flows, a team that has freedom. I don't want to see joystick. I don't want to see joystick soccer anymore from Greg. That's got to stop. But if we go to Copa and there's no copulation, no good copulation, and we got, um, you know, a joystick team for three games and we're out of the first group for me, Greg's gone. Now, yeah. will he be gone for Betty Crocker? No, Betty still likes to have Greg in the kitchen because Greg makes good muffins. According to, <laughs> according to Betty, he does. But until then, you know, my standards. Brian so. McBride was telling us he's a good coach when he could have just said, Greg <laughs> makes good muffins. He does all good have been. Definitely yeah. more engaged. His cream cheese muffins, the best. Cream cheese. <laughs> <laughs> now we need we need a billboard of Greg wrong, wearing yeah. an apron. You know those frilly oh. aprons coming down, holding like some muffins and being <laughs> like, get true. ready, the muffins are coming to Copa near you. Something right. like, there's your marketing. Uh, whole, I need to have like a whole ghost montage of basically uh, a Betty in front of Burhalter and Burhalter showing him how to knead the dough properly. Right. We yeah. need to, we or need you got to Burhalter in the kitchen sideways. And yeah. He turns and he looks at you and he goes, you know? <laughs> you know, I thought you were going somewhere way worse with that. I thought like <laughs> Betty, Betty was going to be right behind him. But anyhow, <laughs> we, we should stop calling Matt Crocker, Matt Crocker. Just call him Betty Crocker because he's the one in the kitchen. And it's in the end, so it's going to be his decision, decision with ingredients and what the recipe is yeah, too much going soul. forward. Yep. Yeah. Think of the snakes and ladders games that will have to ensue <laughs> if Nick does get fired. You know, that's going to be a lot of snakes and ladders for him to play to determine who the next coach is. It, maybe. I mean, it's probably just going to be Jesse Marsh. Jesse's got one foot one oh. foot out of the booth already. He's like, yeah, really- okay, <laughs> don't think, just answer. Would you rather have Greg or Jesse? I'd rather have neither. I no. said, you can't force me to make this decision. No, I agree. They're both <laughs> shit. Oh. If you Jesse offer me more. two rotten apples and force me to ch- pick one, I don't have to pick one. I can kick you in the face. I know who I'm going for, and he's a certain coach that coaches for Hoffenheim in Germany. Yeah, that'll be no Matarazzo. Yes, indeed. What's Pre- what's Perez up to these days? Sorry, Hugo? oh Hugo. no, Hugo is not in the click, so oh. he's got no chance. Matarazzo is no Matarazzo is not. He's not I in mean, the click either, but he's, he's not got... in the click. But they did talk to him. They before did before they hired yes. Greg. Allegedly, I know he said they did. He said oh. they did. And so, they, so they interviewed dreadful. Matarazzo about this. He said, <laughs> they spoke to me. It was toward the end of the hiring process. So it might have been the day before Greg, where Betty Crocker was like, you have to at least find 12 coaches and say you gave him a phone call so we can put it in the press conference that we had an extensive search. <laughs> exactly. That's probably what it was. HR requirement. But yep. they did talk to him. I know they talked to him, but whether or not it was just like, you know, ticking a box as opposed to actually seriously considering him. And I hear uh, his muffins are pretty good too. So. Yeah, his muffins are a lot better than Greg's. And, they are. Uh, and Way Jesse. better. But, Brett, what do you think about Copa? What, what's the bar for you? Uh, personally, I mean, obviously, I would just like them to get into knockout. I would like them to get further than that, of course, but that's my bar. 
Um, but ultimately, it comes down to how the team performs. <coughs> we could, if we, if we, we get knocked out in the group stage, but we performed really well. Just got unlucky because the goalkeeper was, sta- was, sitting, was standing on their head or whatever, hitting the par, hitting the post. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be an argument for that, but knockout stays for me. Um, and really, at the point, it just depends on who we get. Yeah. I don't think there's any world for me, at least that we get grouped and he stays like, I don't care how you get. If you can't figure out how to win those very winnable group, you're out at, not at, for, not at, for Betty P. at home, could, at home, no less at home. Again, this, 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 this could is one of those things where it's seen as an easy group and it should be in comparison, but it's also not a, a group that plays into our hands, our, our fold. We talked about yeah, how the first that's Greg's pro- fault. Oh, I know that's we, Greg's fault. Yes. We can't adjust the bar because Greg is shit at what he does. Yeah, it's yeah. called a handicap. They do it in golf all the time. We're going to like, we're going to be <laughs> our, our world cup group, right? Like, <laughs> is going to have two teams, not Bolivia, Panama, I get it, but who very well could low block, mid to low block us. That's a very real possibility in the World Cup that, you know, the pot C, pot D teams in our group are going to be, like, more conservative against us. So, you know, here's where here's where I sit. So going back to the World Cup, and we could go back further than that, but, like, what we see is, like, okay, Wales, meh, England, nice, good job. Iran, meh, okay. Netherlands, whoa. Right. And that's just continued since he took back over. Right. I did a post on that a couple of weeks back and it's just like, OK, nice, bad opponent, terrible game against a good opponent. And it's just this back and forth into Nations League. Right. Where it's like Jamaica, terrible. We almost just got knocked out by this terrible team. Mexico, nice, good game plan against them. You got to give them credit for it. Whether you liked it, don't liked it. That's your style. I didn't like the geo thing. Still good. Good job. There, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. And like, I think some people, you know, especially with me, people are like, you always hate on Greg. You're an absolutist. I'm like, no, I don't. Like, I don't. Like, after the good performances, I've been positive with him. The problem is you think I hate on him because it's followed by a bad performance that I then get on him about stuff again, right? And like, I want to start to see a level of consistency in our team's play. And consistency doesn't mean you win every game. It doesn't mean you're going to go 4-0 every game. It's a consistent rise up, and I haven't seen that. If you go back to World Cup, are we playing better soccer than we did last year, Nations League under BJ? Are we playing better soccer than we did World Cup qualifying and World Cup? Like, it's all just here. The players are getting older. They're getting better. They're more experienced. They're getting capped more together, and our play isn't rising. That's problematic, right? So what do I want to see? I want to see us get better. (laughs) Like, the goal in the World Cup, is this is the goal it's not the expectation the goal is find a way to get to the semis at home people have done it with similar level rosters in comparison find a way it may or may not be possible you may get a really tough quarterfinal opponent we all know that it's not a guarantee but in order to have that be a possibility you have to have a coach that is putting a team together that every time they go out they're close to their their potential right like they're constantly putting out performances where they're living up to what the potential of the group can be, and they're getting better and better and better. And that's the only way to make that semifinal kind of run. You're not making a semifinal run with the types of performances, you know, we see because you're going to get shitty performance in the group. And now all of a sudden you're second, you have a tougher opponent. Now, you know, you're in a worse spot. So I need to see a result against an Uruguay I need to see a result against, I don't know if we're going to get them, but a Colombia in a quarterfinal. If it's a Brazil in the quarterfinal, I need to see a game plan that makes sense against a Brazil. And I don't, I wouldn't bet anything that we're going to get, get a result in that game. But like, I want to see something that makes me think, cool. Wow. Greg just had us compete against Brazil in a quarterfinal, right? Maybe we lost late. Maybe we lost two nil. Maybe it's one nil late. And we had a couple chances that we blew. And, like, people are like, you're unrealistic. Like, guys, I watched 2002 against Germany when we were literally a handball call away from being tied 1-1 to go to a semifinal. Like, this stuff is possible. I get it's not the expectation, but it's possible, right? Like, we well, won the Even group. more recently, Morocco beat Spain and Portugal exactly. at the World yeah. Cup. And they, Morocco is not that much better than us in terms of player pool. I'm sorry. They're not. So, so that, that's it, man. Like, we got to start to compete because if we want to do anything in the 26 World Cup, you know, and I like, listen, it would be so sad if the 26 World Cup, we just get to the round of 16 and then get, you know, beat and everybody's like, well, that's okay. That's our group. Like, 
that's our level of our team. And it's like, man, that is what bad. will happen because that's mainstream media. Trust that's me, their version they, of success. They, they will, they will brush it under the table. That's what they all do. That's why we just graduated from CONCACAF. Listen, I have nothing against Henry personal. Personally, Henry's a good writer. He's been writing for a long time, almost as long as I've been. I was writing. Mean, he was writing back when I was still writing. He's a good guy in general, but I think that was more of like, I got to get clicks because I, I don't know any reason, any sensible reason you would say that. I just want to see good games. I want to see us compete. I want to see us thrive, even if that means losing against Brazil. I really don't care. I just want to see us compete and, and look and like... Say- we're Same doing thing with Uruguay and Colombia, Derek. Same thing. Like, they're good. They're really good. Like, I get it. I see the chat. 21, like, I get it. I'm not saying we need to win. I'm just saying we need to put out a, a, a freaking performance somewhere against a good team. Like, no. yeah. like I'm going to actually <laughs> – okay, I'm going to go harder than any of you guys here. Greg okay. has had five years with this team, okay? He got a job. He got a renewed a job he didn't deserve. At the press conference, Betty Crocker himself set the tone. He set the bar with his words, if not his actions. He said, we want to beat major teams in competitive international international tournaments, right? That's what he said. Okay. Okay. (laughs) You clearly think that Burhalter is the guy to do that. So now Burhalter needs to fucking do that. He has never beat anybody he wasn't supposed to. Or that he was level with. Mm. Never in once in five years coaching the greatest generation of players we've ever had. So for me, Greg needs to get that signature win in this Copa America. And let me clarify what I what I call a signature win. I don't think it's Uruguay. I think Uruguay is a good team. But if you look at Uruguay's player pool. By the way, they're saying, oh, Uruguay beat Brazil and Argentina. Yeah, do you know why? Because they have a coach named Marcelo Bielsa who got them playing greater than the sum of their parts. That start, go look at that starting lineup that beat Brazil. There were five Liga Mekis players on that team. Okay? Amen. It Uruguay is, has two or three players like Darwin Nunes who are better than anybody we have probably. But when you look at their overall roster, their overall pool, it is better than us marginally. And to be honest, in many positions, I think it's about the same. And we're at home. So beating Uruguay would be great and fantastic, but I don't think it is a job-saving win if you get thrashed by Brazil 4-0 then in the in the, in the the knockout game. So I would think a signature win is beat Brazil or beat Argentina, okay? Now, let's say you don't beat Brazil or Argentina, but you blew both Bolivia and Panama out of the water and squeaked past Uruguay, and you make it close with Brazil— Sure. Okay. Maybe he didn't get that signature win. I could be persuaded based on the quality of performance that, all right, let's give him to the 2026 World Cup. But I think the standard for Greg needs to be a lot higher. I think all of us, even myself included sometimes, have actually lowered the bar for Greg because of his own incompetence. Because Greg has showed us what this team can only be under his stewardship, we end up lowering the bar for him. Instead of going, Bob Bradley beat the best Spanish national team in history in the Confederations Cup final. Bruce Arena you know, got to a World Cup quarterfinal and like Adam said, was a, a bad handball call away from making maybe a World Cup final if we then beat Coastal, uh, South, South Korea. South Korea yeah. And Jurgen gets us out of the absolute shittiest, toughest World Cup group ever in 2014. But Greg has done nothing, nothing that we're going to hold on to in the future and go, that was amazing. There are, mm-hmm. you know, it's all CONCACAF success and, and then only at home. And this is and this team is better in terms of player pools than any of those other teams that we've had in the past. So I, I really don't want us to lower the bar of expectation in order to accommodate Greg's own incompetence because I think that's the mistake our media makes. And we mm. give him a pass. Well, he looked good against Panama. So fucking what? We're supposed to. No, yep. like compare even Mexico. We're excited to beat Mexico because it's a rivalry. Great. What? Look at the, the lineups of the two teams. It shouldn't have been close. I don't and, know. I, I don't, no, no, you're oh, right. No, you're absolutely right, Pete. That, that you know, I think that we've all had to live with reality, right? But that doesn't mean we have to stoop. And we, I don't think anybody should stoop. I think we need to hold them. But you know what? There are so many people out there on X and mainstream media who defend Greg constantly. 
It's so bad that when they get near you and they breathe on you, you can smell Burhalter's testicles on their <laughs> breath. On their breath. It's it's repulsive. And I don't understand why we, we've got to that place. And if we want to get into the – if we really were going to dig deep into the whole – the existential reasons that, that Greg is there. We don't have enough time, Derek. He, he shouldn't be there in the first place. <laughs> so let's just start from there. And yes, um, when Greg has a good game, like he did against Mexico, I don't slap him in the nutsack. I say, hey, you did some things all right there. That looked pretty decent. But it, like here, are the, here are the reasons why it looks so decent. I, I gotta, you got to provide context. And so many of these morons out there don't. They just come out like Michael Cameron. Greg Berhalter has won more games in CONCACAF than any other manager ever. Didn't he read yeah. that to a press conference? He had a, like, a yeah. paper that he read that out? Like a yes. fucking scribe well, yeah. reading a decree in medieval <laughs> England? They stopped cutting. They cut that out, by the way, after we made fun of yeah. it. And I don't know if it's directly from us, but Michael Cameron knows we used it to happens, make fun it of it every show. Now, actually, yes, but. it happens off yeah. camera. They no longer do that before um, before Greg gets there. But there's just too much self. Um, there's too much uh, self delusion going on at U.S. Soccer. There's too much self delusion. If you're still calling your substitute solutions, I've got. I got an. I got. I got to say. There's nothing more ridiculous. So if the guy coming out wasn't a solution, the guy you're bringing in is a solution, then the guy you're taking out wasn't a solution, which means he's an anti-solution. So that doesn't he's make it problem. any better. He's a problem. He's a problem. What, he's a, problem. Yeah. what if you just call him a problem? Here comes the said. solution. Yeah. Yeah. Stop <laughs> using coded language and all this um, corporate Don't. speak. Stop it. Don't it's, forget these. your fullbacks are superheroes. Yeah. yeah. That's my or, favorite one. And the defenders are African <laughs> dogs. Yeah, there we are. Hey, can I, I want to give two two other reasons to add on, Pete, why we need to raise the bar. One, second cycle manager. Uh, second cycle managers yes. can't have the bar be the same. You were brought back for a reason, and that's because you made the quarterfinals last time away. Now you're back. Or sorry, you made you made the knockout last time, right? Now you're back, right? Raising the bar is the quarterfinals by definition in the World Cup, right? Like quarterfinals in the World Cup is not like an unrealistic expectation. It should be where we set the bar, right? And then the second one is it's so unique because this player pool was really young last cycle. They are no longer really young. They are all getting into prime ages. And by 26, mm -hmm. many of them will actually be right in their prime, right in the sweet spot, 26, 27 years old. And you have got a the best generation of talent we've ever had coming into their own. It looks like all establishing themselves at high level clubs or good clubs. And it's just like the ball, you're spot on, Pete, right? All of us have such low expectations because we've become so negative. I have for sure. I'm like, I know what this is gonna be. So <laughs> there's the bar. Oh, we beat Mexico again. Good job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, but no, screw that, right? Going into Copa, let's all raise the bar a little bit, right? Yes. And if it's not everybody is so results oriented, right? Like, well, you're saying the semifinal, the quarter. I don't care how far we make it, right? Process over results here. And the process to get to 26 means we are going to show growth in Copa. And I don't know, that's that's very subjective. I get it, but I know what growth to me means. And growth to me is like show up, beat the teams you're supposed to beat, don't make it a sweat, show up in the games, show up in an Uruguay game, go get that done. Play then, better than the sum of your parts. And then show yeah. up in the knockout. And like you said, Pete, like, okay, yeah, you don't get your ass handed to us like we did against Netherlands. Sorry, guys. Yeah. It was a 3-0 game where a ball deflected off Haji's foot. That's a 3-0 game, guys. Yeah. We got our ass handed. And we you were tactically funny? outfought, outclassed, exactly. and outsmarted. You know, the funniest part about this entire hour and 30 minutes we've been on, and this is something going back to what you said, Adam, is where somebody had – Claim that you are just overly negative all the time on Burhalter, and they'll look at this this hour and thirty minutes, and they'll see they'll they'll ignore the first thirty five to forty minutes where we spent talking about great things that Burhalter did, and they'll go right to that five minute clip where where Pete went on an epic rant, and basically say, "See, these guys right here, they're the toxic ones. They're the ones that are holding us back. They're the ones that are making us look bad or scaring away all the people." That's yeah, it's so ridiculous. It's the joy of being a content creator, I guess. We're we're the ones holding back Greg from doing a good job. That is so oh yeah, it's hilarious. our fault. It's our fault. Adam has too many basketball metaphors. Greg can't put them all on a PowerPoint, so the guys aren't learning. Um, where are we, are we a baseball metaphor next time? 
<laughs> that's even, that's even want, more removed. I want, I want, I want like Petank. You know that French game, Petank? Have any of you ever oh, yeah, played yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, so where they throw line, metal balls at each other. <laughs> Derek, you would like it. It seems right up your alley. Because well, it has balls in it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the level of this humor on this on this channel right now. Eighties <laughs> nostalgia guy says, "Invite American Ultras talk to your show. I love those guys. I met them both in Austin. They're fantastic guys, doing great stuff. If you guys go subscribe to them, I am going to have them on or potentially go to their channel if they'll have me. But yeah, they're great dudes, doing their best. Um, bringing more more content creators is always better. Um, make tickets free for kids near the area, Albert. Yes, I agree." Honestly, they should be giving out tickets to schools, you know, and not just U.S. soccer, but academies, academies. You know, if you're in an an Orlando academy and the U.S. is playing in Orlando, why not give all those kids a free ticket? Why not? Yep. You know what? They get a free ticket. Their parents might come with them and buy the $19 churro that you try to stuff down their (laughs) face. Okay. So it's not just that you're going to get people in the stadium, but they're also going to buy merch and concessions and pay the $800 for parking, whatever the fuck it is nowadays to go to an MLS game. It's always worth it. And I don't understand why a actor, uh, you know, knows more about some of this stuff than guys who are supposedly responsible for doing it. Um, Spencer Doherty. Doherty. Doherty, Irish, yeah. right? Yes. Spencer Doherty. As a college student, I 100% agree with the ticket pricing ideas. It's so <laughs> frustrating, and I know Indiana will never get a USA M&T game, sadly. <laughs> he's tr- he's right. true. He's, he's right. He's absolutely right. We're never going to get on. one. We're never going to get the, one. I love the 569, by the way. Uh, he does that on very our show. specific. It's so good. He does that on our show all the time. He just wants Stack to say, uh, what does he say when it's 69? What does what Stack generally say when he says 69? Nice. 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 We say giggity, but he says yeah. nice. Uh, well, guys, this is fun. I love doing this post camp. I think we have a good balance, you know, between like my general intensity, your guys' humor, but also like strong opinions. And then Adam, nobody can figure out Adam. Adam's like the James Bond of the American soccer, like, you know, community, because we don't know how old you are. All of a sudden you've got three kids. You're, you know, a lot about soccer, but everything is somehow basketball you know about from the eighties. Tack met up with you last week. He's like, Adam's like seven foot seven. <laughs> There's all these like mysteries around Adam Turner. Are you related to Matt Turner? Are you related to Ethan Horvath somewhere? Cause that's a rumor that's been spreading. It does but, look like, it's like that's yeah. a great point. Actually. I didn't, this I didn't it's good. Really, to, it's good to see you guys. 40-year-old former basketball coach, tech consultant. That's it. Pretty boring, guys. But, hey, next well, time I'm in L.A. That's what he wants us to believe. By next night, time I'm in L.A., superhero. we're, we're going we're gonna to make it happen. Yeah, come out to L.A., man, or when I'm on the East Coast. Is that Anything is that else like, you guys want to talk about? Is is that, that, well, we were talking about James Bond. Um, <laughs> so is that three kids, three wags, or just one <laughs> wag? One wag. <laughs> okay. One wag. Not so game bondish then. <laughs> well, though there are other kids, they just don't get included in the official. Tab, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You never know who's out there. But they do. <laughs> they do eat into his account, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pete, there's, there's one time. There's one time you were you went to you were recently in Chicago, and somebody on Twitter said, "Hey, you're gonna make it down to Indy," and you're like, "Why would I make it down to Indy?" And Derek and I sat in the corner and cried. <laughs> we're down here. <laughs> Guys, should we do a Chicago fire rant? I do these on my show regularly now because I hate them. So does Brett. <laughs> I, I, I just get so angry. Every time. This year, I was like, I'm really going to – I think the fire could be good this year, right? I got Hugo That's Pipers me. That's me. And Costa. You guys are both delusional. <laughs> and I was like – but then they still you know, renewed this George Heights and Frank Klopas. And so I sit there and I watch this team. Like, I could coach this team better than Frank Klopas could. With that yeah, much – it's true. Uh, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. They should be a lot better than what they are. Yeah, I, I keep trying to talk Brett out I, of being I want, a fan for Chicago. I, want, I think it's I want, ridiculous. I to, after after I know I know it's against a, uh, a USL two team, which is basically just semi pro at that point. But I want to see some. Of, I want to see some of the players from the uh, the Fire two team that was playing in that game brought up. That was much more enjoyable to watch. Yeah, it was. And after games, but you guys have Indy eleven right there, right near both of you. We we helped start in eleven, yeah. so yeah, we're we're still in games. We're on, we not go to games on, anymore. We're on the BYB board for five plus years. Seven total. Derek was uh, Derek. Was I was president, the president. Was nice president. Yep. So do you guys? But do you guys not go anymore or what? Uh, not as much. Way. He's got family. I'm, I'm at a point now where my family, my kids are old enough that I could take them to the game and be worthwhile. 
I went to two games and, last season. And we had, we had talked about uh, going down and covering covering it a bit more, but I'm like, gonna try to head like, some Orange like, County games this year. I'm really pissed off at Don Garber, so yeah, I'm gonna start supporting his rivals. That's did you did you see the most recent topic. athletic? Ar- did you see the most recent athletic article about that? Was the uh, the anonymous in, or GM uh, meeting? And like they asked all the GMs of all the teams uh, if they want a full MLS teams to play in uh, U.S. Open Cup, and it was like 24 of them said yes or something like that. But it was did like they just say that to no. the athletic, or did they? Yeah, yeah, they said it to the athletic. When it's all anonymous at that point too, though, so who knows? Right. So well, not uh, it's not anonymous to them, I'm sure, but that's a whole nother topic, and we actually covered it, and we were really thorough with that interview with uh, your homeboy ex. Uh, Chicago Fire guy who's now the big uh, VP Snake oil of, salesman. Yeah, for uh, MLS and and the interview they did with uh, her Rodriguez and, and Nelson Seb Rodriguez, Rodriguez. Nelson you Rodriguez, Nelson Rodriguez. No, no, they it's had always, Nelson. You know, we, broke, oh. we broke down their interview with him, and with her, oh, her, yeah. that is a slime her, ball. If I've ever, um, <clears> yes, <throat> we 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 love her and Seb, but frankly, they let him slime his slime all over in that interview because her I don't. Slime. I don't think any follow-up questions were allowed. That's what we kind of garnered. So, mm. yeah. When, 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 when was it? When was that interview? Uh, go, go. If you go back to uh, Straight Red Card and and you you go through our okay. yeah, uh, yeah, find it on your channel. Our video video section, yeah. not our live section. You can Camera scroll down and, and find out find our breakdown of that That's interview. Nelson Rodriguez. He's on. He's on the. He's on the thumbnail. And we never heard from Herb and Seb. Uh, Seb. We didn't do it behind their back. We tagged him in it. We we're like. This is what we think you what happened in your interview, and you oh. cannot, you know, like it or whatever, but we're not going to do it behind your back. So. Yeah. I think this is a great way to end the stream with some great advice from Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, guys, sleeping with your stepsis is okay. <laughs> but your first <laughs> cousin <laughs> might get get you used. circumcision. <laughs> I am I am so lost. I know there's stepsister jokes on the channel. But I'm sure I miss out on a lot of the context. So can somebody explain? Yeah, yeah. So we had a guy who came <laughs> on our show once, and um, and he was talking about this this whole family problem he was having. Like his uh, new mom and his old his real dad, they got married, and um, they were both divorced. They got married, so all these kids came into the family. But he was well into you know his teens, and so was um, you know the girl who was also about the same age as he was 16 and they decided they really were attracted to each other and they had a relationship and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, it's really distressing. And they all think we're doing something really horrible. I'm like, dude, you're not technically related in any freaking way. And I don't think you should let them shame you about being attracted to each other and want to get married. I understand it looks weird, but you're not actually textually uh, having a, um, an incestual relationship. And that discussion then spurred off into all kinds of other crazy <laughs> crap. And I mean, it's just insane. And now we, we talk about it every show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's Amazing. Awesome. I, people are coming on to my sending super chats. Is this the channel that gives me stepsister <laughs> advice in the middle of my live stream? <laughs> Oh, people, people clip it and they send it our way, so we, we see it all. Yeah, not, they send guys, it to us, guys. I'm not gonna lie, on my Google tabs right now is stepsisters. Is that a movie? <laughs> like, I thought I was like missing a I was like, Adam. Pay attention, you might have this problem with those extra kids. You never I know. know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was like, I know stepbrother, I love that movie, love it. Stepsister, did I miss something? Yeah. You guys gave me like, I was just kind of smiling and nodding my way through all the step stuff. I was like, oh, cool, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna Adam's like, how can I turn this into a basketball reference? <laughs> well, and then somebody actually said, well, what about your cousin? And then we had to draw the line there. Right? Oh my god! Unless they're in Kentucky, yeah. where they're passing legislation for it to be legal. Yeah, you I are. Think third oh, cousins they, is the line, right? It is technically, except for if you live for in now. Kentucky, where they are going to lower it back down to first cousins again. Mm-hmm. Oh no! But that's yeah. like that's like genetically not okay. I don't think. No, just look at the Habsburgs. <laughs> look at Charles. The, just yeah, look that's at Charles really the bad. Second, mm-hmm. Charles they not the like look at the, the science form. before they allow that or? I just they got a lot of people in the in the Kentucky um, house that are kind of used to this sound. Do do ding 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 ding. So you're, you're yeah. turning off all the young viewers again. They have no idea what delivery. I know they have no what re- idea what reference that was. 
<laughs> Great movie, Burt Reynolds. Look it up. <laughs> All right, last one, guys. What do you guys think of Cole Campbell after this camp? I didn't <laughs> no. watch him, so I have no idea. I, I heard he got two goals against Guinea. Of course, yeah. not Guinea. He was with the U19s, wasn't he? The U19. So the, he's with the yeah, U20s. No, the it, game was not broadcast, so it's hard to say. I'm glad he scored some goals. I have not watched Cole Campbell play. I don't have an opinion on him at all. Does yeah. anybody has anybody watched him? So, so let me clarify. Let me clarify. Here is a you, uh, 18 year old or 19 year old, I believe, who just turned, um, just turned 18. We talked about it. Okay, just turned 18. Um, who plays not for Dortmund too. He plays for the Dortmund youth squads. Yeah. He has not yet made it or advanced to Dortmund too. He's 18. Who played for for Dortmund? When he was 18, Reyna. Who played for Dortmund when he was 18? Pulisic. All right, so don't get overly excited about a kid who's still 18, hasn't even played for the two team yet. I'm yeah. glad he scored two goals. I'm happy for him. But I am not whipping out the lube and getting all excited and bothered about an 18-year-old who is yet to even play a game for Dortmund. Yeah, another team. I can't do it, Julian. I can't do it, Julian. Uh, there was uh, – I just before the show I saw on Twitter that uh, he actually did an interview as far as uh, why he chose to, to represent the United States. I don't know if anybody saw this or not. Uh, but he actually played a game – he played a game against the team that had Bacon on the, on the team. And, oh, Bacon and Iceland. And Bacon went over there and he's like, hey, you should really think about representing the United States. It's a great opportunity. By you Bacon, probably... you mean Aaron Johansson, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. I just don't know if everybody knows that reference. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin, the Kevin Bacon of the United, United States national team. That's who it is. Right. Uh, but yeah, he, he's That's the a 10 year old reference, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> it really is. Uh, but he's the one He's the one who went over to this kid and said, you know, you should really consider representing the United States. It's a great, it's a great opportunity. Yeah. So, that's cool. The other thing they said, also, do you guys think Griffin Yao can get called to the first team soon? No. no I mean, I Griffin Yao has to be – he's still in Belgium. He has scored <laughs> a couple of goals. He's not – guys, we have to start upping the level for what it means to get called into the first team. Already, Kevin Paredes and Taylor Booth weren't called into this team, right, because they're still with the under-23s. Griffin Yao will probably be – I don't know if he'll be in the Olympic roster, but he'll be in contention for it. One good goal against France does not make Griffin Yao a world beater any more than a deflected Cade Cowell goal makes him a UEFA Champions League starter. Or <laughs> one trick point. pony. <laughs> yeah, it's you super know, one trick he, pony. 20, 22, 21? Cowell? Yao, yeah, he's not young. Oh, Yao's like 22. I remember Yao from that 2017 sure. under 17 uh, World Cup. Yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll see, right? I mean, but he's playing in Belgium and. I don't know. There's nothing to indicate that he's close right no, now. I'm not marking him out, but is he playing for Anderlecht? Is he playing for Gang? He's playing he's for – um, No, West, no, I know he's West, playing for Westerlo. 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 I absolutely yeah. – it's Westerlo, by the way. Is it Westerlo? Yes. It would take oh, really? two O's to make one, a move. One like, O. <laughs> two, two O's, like Makes Waterloo, sense. famous battle Waterloo. That's oh. two O's. Wester low is one Oh, it's Wester low, but listen, I know he's playing there, but I, what my point was, he's not playing at Anderlecht. He's not playing for one of the big boys in Belgium yet. Even he's having a really good season. Let's let him keep it up, but he's got a lot of people above him. He needs to climb over still. So yeah, for sure. All right, guys, let's end it here. It's been an hour and 45. It always goes longer. I know it's late on the East coast already. You're welcome. Adam's got kids up in the morning, <laughs> you know, Derek's got his lube to go play with. So we've got, <laughs> but this is fun. And thank you for hanging. I'll, I'll try to hop on the straight red. You give whenever you guys want this coming week. I'm free. If you want me to hop on, if not, let me know when you're free and I'll hop on. That that's, was so perfect. Actually. That's perfect. Brett's out of town and I need a co-host. Let's do next, it. Next Monday. Monday. What time on Monday? Uh, 815 EST. So that's 515 my time. Yeah, I can do it. Let's do it, Pete. I'll send awesome. you the link. Okay. Guys, right. subscribe to the Straight Red. Subscribe to American Ultras. I'm sorry. Let me make sure I got this right. American Ultras Talk as well. Um, and if you're on Twitter, go give Stan underscore USMNT a follow. Thanks, guys. This was fun. Always a pleasure. See you all soon.